This is section 45 of Mark Twain Speaking. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Remarks as Chairman Mugwump Rally, Allen Hall, Hartford, October 20th, 1884. Read by John Greenman. Ladies and gentlemen, this is an informal meeting. I am asked to preside, and I believe I am the only legally appointed officer. I know it is customary to read a long list of vice-presidents, but I forgot all about it. So all gentlemen present, regardless of their political complexion, will be kind enough to act as vice-presidents. As far as my own political change of heart is concerned, I have not been convinced by any democratic means. The opinion I hold of Mr. Blaine is due to the comments of the Republican press before the nomination, not that they have said bitter or scandalous things, because Republican papers are above that, but the things they said did not seem to be complimentary, and seemed to me to imply editorial disapproval of Mr. Blaine, and the belief that he was not qualified to be President of the United States. I had read those papers in the past, and what they said appeared to me to be convincing. The editors seemed to me to consider him unfit to be President of the United States, and as I had confidence in the integrity of my friends, the editors of the local Republican press, these things reduced my estimate of Mr. Blaine to what it now is. The personality of a man, or his character, gives immense weight to what he says or does. Take General Hawley's paper, for instance, and what it has said of Blaine in the past. I consider I am a mugwump constructed by General Hawley. It is just a little indelicate for me to be here on this occasion before an assemblage of voters, for the reason that the ablest newspaper in Colorado, the ablest newspaper in the world, has recently nominated me for president. It is hardly fit for me to preside at a discussion of the brother candidate but the best among us will do the most repulsive things the moment we are smitten with a presidential madness if i had realized that this canvas was to turn on the candidate's private character i would have started that colorado paper sooner i know the crimes that can be imputed and proved against me can be told on the fingers of your hands not all your hands but only just simply the most of them this cannot be said of any other presidential candidate in the field end of remarks as chairman read by john greenman this is section forty six of mark twain speaking this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mock Oration on the Dead Partisan, Early November, 1884. Read by John Greenman. Mr. Chairman, that is a noble and beautiful ancient sentiment which admonishes us to speak well of the dead. Therefore, let us try to do this for our late friend who is mentioned in the text how full of life and strength and confidence and pride he was but a few short months ago and alas how dead he is to-day we that are gathered at these obsequies we that are here to bury this dust and sing the parting hymn and say the comforting word to the widow and the orphan now left destitute and sorrowing by him their support and stay in the post-office the consulship the 
navy yard and the indian reservation we knew him right well and familiarly we knew him and so it is meet that we and not strangers should take upon ourselves these last offices lest his reputation suffer through explanations of him which might not explain him happily and justifications of him which might not justify him conclusively first it is right and well that we censure him in those few minor details wherein some slight censure may seem to be demanded to the end that when we come to speak his praises the good he did may shine with all the more intolerable a brightness by the contrast to begin then with the twilight side of his character he was a slave not a turbulent and troublesome but a meek and docile cringing and fawning dirt-eating and dirt-preferring slave and party was his lord and master he had no mind of his own no will of his own no opinion of his own body and soul he was the property and chattel of that master to be bought and sold bartered traded given away at his nod and beck branded mutilated boiled in oil if need were and the desire of his heart was to make of a nation of free men a nation of slaves like to himself to bring to pass a time when it might be said that all are for the party and none are for the state and the labors of his diligent hand and brain did finally compass his desire for he fooled the people with plausible new readings of familiar old principles and beguiled them to the degradation of their manhood and the destruction of their liberties he taught them that the only true freedom of thought is to think as the party thinks that the only true freedom of speech is to speak as the party dictates that the only righteous toleration is toleration of what the party approves that patriotism duty citizenship devotion to country loyalty to the flag are all summed up in loyalty to the party save the party uphold the party make the party victorious though all things else go to ruin and the grave in these few little things he who lies here cold in death was faulty say we no more concerning them but over them draw the veil of a charitable oblivion for the good which he did far overpasses this little evil with grateful hearts we may unite in praises and thanksgivings to him for one majestic fact of his life that in his zeal for the cause he finally overdid it the precious result was that a change came and that change remains and will endure and on its banner is written not all are for the party now some are for the state end of mock oration on the dead partisan read by john greenman this is section forty seven of mark twain speaking this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. On Speech Making Reform. Tile Club Dinner for Lawrence Hutton, New York, March 31, 1885. Read by John Greenman. Like many another well intentioned man, I have made too many speeches, and like other transgressors of this sort, I have from time to time reformed, 
binding myself by oath on new year's days to never make another speech i found that a new oath holds pretty well but that when it is become old and frayed out and damaged by a dozen annual retyings of its remains it ceases to be serviceable any little strain will snap it so last new year's day i strengthened my reform with a money penalty and made that penalty so heavy that it has enabled me to remain pure from that day uh, to this although i am falling once more now i think i can behave myself from this out because the penalty is going to be doubled ten days hence i see before me and about me the familiar faces of many poor sorrowing fellow sufferers victims of the passion for speech-making poor sad-eyed brothers in affliction who fast in the grip of this fell degrading demoralizing vice have grown weak with struggling as the years drifted by and at last have all but given up hope to them i say in this last final obituary of mine don't give up don't do it there is still hope for you i beseech you swear one more oath and back it up with cash i do not say this to all of course for there are some among you who are past reform some who uh, being long accustomed to success and to the delicious intoxication of the applause which follows it are too wedded to their dissipation to be capable now or hereafter of abandoning it they have thoroughly learned the deep art of speech-making and they suffer no longer from those misgivings and embarrassments and apprehension which are really the only things which ever make a speech-maker want to reform they have learned their art by long observation and slowly compacted experience so now they know what they did not know at first that the best and most telling speech is not the actual impromptu one but the counterfeit of it they know that that speech is most worth listening to which has been carefully prepared in private and tried on a plaster cast or an empty chair or any other appreciative object that will keep quiet until the speaker has got his matter and his delivery limbered up so that they will seem impromptu to an audience the expert knows that a touch of indifferent grammar flung in here and there apparently at random has a good effect often restores the confidence of a suspicious audience he arranges these errors in private for a really random error wouldn't do any good it would be sure to fall in the wrong place he also leaves blanks here and there leaves them where genuine impromptu remarks can be dropped in of a sort that will add to the natural aspect of the speech without breaking its line of march at the banquet he listens to the other speakers invents happy turns upon remarks of theirs and sticks these happy turns into his blanks for impromptu use by and by when he shall be called up 
when this expert rises to his feet he looks around over the house with the air of a man who has just been strongly impressed by something the uninitiated cannot interpret his aspect but the initiated can they know what is coming when the noise of the clapping and the stamping has subsided this veteran says aware that the hour is late mr chairman it was my intention to abide by a purpose which i framed in the beginning of the evening to simply rise and return my duty and thanks in case i should be called upon and then make way for men more able and who have come with something to say but sir i was so struck by general smith's remark concerning the proneness of evil to fly upward that etc 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 and before you know it he has slidden s i c smoothly along on his compliment to the general and out of it and into his set speech and you can't tell to save you where it was nor when it was that he made the connection and that man will soar along in the most beautiful way on the wings of a practiced memory heaving in a little decayed grammar here and a little wise tautology there and a little neatly counterfeited embarrassment yonder and a little finely acted stumbling and stammering for a word rejecting this word and that and finally getting the right one and fetching it out with ripping effect and with the glad look of a man who has got out of a bad hobble entirely by accident and wouldn't take a hundred dollars for that accident and every now and then he will sprinkle you in one of those happy turns on something that has previously been said and at last with supreme art he will catch himself when in the very act of sitting down and lean over the table and fire a parting rocket in the way of an afterthought which makes everybody stretch his mouth as it goes up and dims the very stars in heaven when it explodes and yet that man has been practicing that afterthought and that attitude for about a week well you can't reform that kind of a man it's a case of eli joined to his idols let him alone but there is one sort that can be reformed that is the genuinely impromptu speaker i mean the man who didn't expect to be called upon and isn't prepared and yet goes waddling and warbling along just as if he thought it wasn't any harm to commit a crime so long as it wasn't premeditated now and then he says but i must not detain you longer every little while he says just one word more and i'm done but at these times he always happens to think of two or three more unnecessary things and so he stops to say them now that man has no way of finding out how long his windmill is going he likes to hear it creak and so he goes on creaking and listening to it and enjoying it never thinking of the flight of time and when he comes to sit down at last and look under his hopper he is the most surprised person in the house to see what a little bit of grist he has ground and how unconscionably long he has been grinding it as a rule he finds that he hasn't said anything a discovery which the unprepared man ought usually to make and does usually make and has the added grief of making it 
at second hand too this is a man who can be reformed and so can his near relative who now rises out of my reconstructed past the man who provisions himself with a single prepared bite of a sentence or two and trusts to luck to catch quails and mana as he goes along this person frequently gets left you can easily tell when he has finished his prepared bit and begun on the impromptu part often the prepared portion has been built during the banquet it may consist of ten sentences but oftener consists of two oftenest of all it is but a single sentence and it has seemed so happy and pat and bright and good that the creator of it the person that laid it has been sitting there cackling privately over it and admiring it and petting it and shining it up and imagining how fine it is going to go when of course he ought to have been laying another one and still another one and maybe a dozen or basketful if it's a fruitful day yes and he is thinking that when he comes to hurl that egg at the house there is going to be such an electric explosion of applause that the inspiration of it will fill him instantly with ideas and clothe the ideas in brilliant language and that an impromptu speech will result which will be infinitely finer than anything he could have deliberately prepared but there are two damaging things which he is leaving out of the calculation one is the historical fact that a man is never called upon as soon as he thinks he is going to be called upon and that every speech that is injected into the proceedings ahead of him gives his fires an added chance to cool and the other thing which he is forgetting is that he can't sit there and keep saying that fine sentence of his over and over to himself for three quarters of an hour without by and by getting a trifle tired of it and losing somewhat of confidence in it when at last his chance comes and he touches off his pet sentence it makes him sick to see how shamefacedly and apologetically he has done it and how compassionate the applause is and how sorry everybody feels and then he bitterly thinks what a lie it is to call this a free country where none but the unworthy and the undeserving may swear and at this point naked and blind and empty he wallows off into his real impromptu speech stammers out three or four incredibly flat things then collapses into his seat murmuring i wish i was in he doesn't say where because he doesn't the stranger at his left says your opening was very good stranger at his right says i liked your opening man opposite says opening very good indeed very good two or three other people mumble something about his opening people always feel obliged to pour some healing thing on a crippled man that way they mean it for oil they think it is oil but the sufferer recognizes it for aqua fortis end of on speech making reform read by john greenman this is section 48 of mark twain speaking this librivox recording is in the public domain huck saves jim from huckleberry finn a reading often used from 1885 on read by john greenman night after night they kept a sharp lookout for Cairo, where the ohio river comes in for there they would land 
and try to escape far north and east away from the domain of slavery jim said if the two big rivers joined together there that would show but i said maybe we might think we was passing the foot of an island and coming into the same old river again now that disturbed jim and me too so the question was what to do i said paddle ashore the first time a light showed and tell them pap was behind coming along with a trading scow and was a green hand at the business and wanted to know how far it was to Cairo. jim thought it was a good idea so we took a smoke on it and waited there weren't nothing to do now but look out sharp for the town and not pass it without seeing it he said he'd be mighty sure to see it because he'd be a free man the minute he seen it but if he missed it he'd be in the slave country again and no more show for freedom every little while he jumps up and says dash is but it warn't it was only jack-o'-lanterns or lightning bugs so he set down again and went to watching same as before jim said it made him all over trembly and feverish to be so close to freedom well i could tell you it made me all over trembly and feverish too to hear him because i begun to get it through my head that he was most free and who was to blame for it why me the thought struck me cold i couldn't get that out of my conscience no how nor no way oh i had committed a crime i knowed it perfectly well i could see it now it got to troubling me so i couldn't rest i couldn't stay still in one place it hadn't ever come home to me before what this thing was that i was doing but now it did and it stayed with me and scorched me more and more i tried to make out to myself that i weren't to blame because i didn't run jim off from his rightful owner but it weren't no use conscience up and says every time but you knowed he was running for his freedom and you could have paddled ashore and told somebody that was so yes it was so i couldn't get around that no way that was where it pinched conscience says to me what had poor miss watson done to you that you could see her nigger go off right under your eyes and never say one single word what did that poor old woman do to you that you could treat her so mean why she tried to learn you your book she tried to learn you your manners she tried to learn you to be a christian she tried to be good to you every way she knowed how that's what she done i got to feeling so mean and treacherous and so miserable i most wished i was dead i fidgeted up and down the raft abusing myself to myself and jim was fidgeting up and down past me we neither of us could keep still every time he danced around and says dies cairo it went through me like a sword and i thought if it was cairo i reckoned i would die of miserableness jim talked out loud all the time while i was talking to myself he was saying how the first thing he would do when he got to a free state he would go to saving up money and never spend a single cent and when he got enough he would buy his wife which was owned on a farm close to where miss watson lived and then they would both work to buy the two children and if their master wouldn't sell them they'd get an abolitionist to go and steal them it was awful to hear it it most froze me to hear such talk he wouldn't ever dared to talk such talk in his life before 
just see what a difference it made in him the minute he judged he was about free it was according to the old saying give a nigger an inch and he'll take an ell thinks i this is what comes of my not thinking here was this nigger which i had as good as helped to run away coming right out flat-footed and saying he would steal his children children that belonged to a man i didn't even know a man that hadn't ever done me no harm i was sorry to hear jim say that it was such a lowering of him my conscience got to stirring me up hotter than ever until at last i says to it let up on me it ain't too late yet i'll paddle ashore at the first light and tell oh it was a blessed thought i never can tell how good it made me feel cause i knowed i was doing right now i felt easy and happy and light as a feather right off all my troubles was gone i went to looking out sharp for a light and sort of singing to myself by and by one showed jim sings out we safe huck we safe jump up and crack your heels dat's de good old caro at last i just knows it we safe huck we safe sure's you's born we safe i says i'll take the canoe and go see jim it mightn't be you know he jumped up and got the canoe ready and put his old coat in the bottom for me to set on and give me the paddle and as i shoved off he says pooty soon i'll be a shout for joy and i'll say it's all on account of huck i's a free man and i couldn't ever been free if it hadn't been for huck huck done it jim won't ever forget you huck you's de best friend jim's ever had and you's de only friend old jim's got now oh bless the good old heart of you huck i was paddling off all in a sweat to tell on him but when he says this it seemed to kind of take the tuck all out of me and kind of all unsettled me and i couldn't seem to tell whether i was doing right or doing wrong i went along slow then and i weren't right down certain whether i was glad i started or whether i weren't when i was a hundred and fifty yards off jim sings out across the darkness and says there you goes the old true huck the only white gentleman that ever kept his promise to old jim well i just felt sick but i says i got to do it i can't get out of it right then along comes a skiff with two men in it with guns and they stopped and i stopped one of em says what's that yonder a piece of raft i says do you belong to it yes sir any men on it only one sir well there's five niggers run off tonight up yonder above the head of the bend is your man white or black i didn't answer up prompt i tried to but the words wouldn't come i tried for a second or two to brace up and out with it but i weren't man enough hadn't the spunk of a rabbit i see i was weakening the man says come answer up is he white or black then i hear the voice across the water is saying de good old huck de good old huck and i just let go and give up and says he's white it took you a good while to get it out i reckon we'll go and see for ourselves oh i wish you would says i because it's pap that's there and maybe you'd help me tow the raft ashore where the light is he's sick he's awful sick and so is ma'am and mary ann and the baby oh the devil we're in a hurry boy but i s'pose we've got to come buckle to your paddle and let's get along i buckled to my paddle like sam hill and says hi george in luck at last and they laid to their oars when we'd gone about a hundred yards i says pap'll be mighty obleeged to you i can tell you 
everybody goes away when i want them to help me tow the raft ashore and i can't do it by myself well that's infernal mean and pretty soon he says look a here it's odd too say boy what's the matter with your father it's the uh the well it ain't anything much they stopped pulling it weren't but a mighty little ways to the raft now one says boy that's a lie what is the matter with your pap answer up square now and it'll be the better for you blubbering i will sir i will honest but don't leave us please it's the uh, the gentleman if you'll only pull ahead and let me heave you the headline you won't have to come near the raft please do set her back john set her back keep away boy keep to lord confound it i just expect the wind has blowed it to us your pap's got the smallpox and you know it precious well why didn't you come out and say so you want to spread it all over well says i i've told everybody before and then and then and then they just went away and left us bellows poor devil there's something in that we are right down sorry for you but we well hang it we don't want the smallpox you see oh, look here i'll tell you what to do don't you try to land by yourself or you'll smash everything to pieces you float along down about twenty miles and you'll come to a town on the left-hand side of the river it will be long after sun-up then and when you ask for help you tell them your folks are all down with chills and fever don't be a fool again and let people guess what is the matter i feel mighty mean to leave you but my kingdom it won't do to fool with smallpox don't you see good-bye good-bye if you see any runaway niggers you get help and nab them and you can make some money by it good-bye sir says i i won't let no runaway niggers get by me if i can help it they went off and i got aboard the raft feeling bad and low because i knowed very well i had done wrong and i seed it warn't no use for me to try to learn to do right a body that don't get started right when he's little ain't got no show when the pinch comes there ain't nothing to back him up and keep him to his work and so he gets beat then i thought a minute and says to myself hold on s'pose you'd a done right and give jim up would you feel better than what you do now no says i i'd feel bad i'd feel just the same way i do now as far as i can see a conscience is put in you just to object to whatever you do do it don't make no difference what it is well then says i what's the use of learning to do right when it's troublesome to do right and ain't no trouble to do wrong and the wages is just the same i was stuck i couldn't answer that so i reckoned i wouldn't bother no more about it but after this always do whichever come handiest at the time end of huck saves jim read by john greenman This is section 49 of Mark Twain Speaking. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Compositor. This speech, delivered at the Tapothete Dinner, Demonico's, New York, January 18, 1886, is followed by a version rejected by Mark Twain. Read by John Greenman. I am staggered by the compliments which have been lavished and poured out on me by my friend on my right i am as proud of this compliment as i am staggered it is uncommon in my experience it is the first time that anybody in my experience has stood up in the presence of a large and respectable assemblage of gentlemen like this and confessed that i have told the truth once if i could return the compliment i would do it the chairman's 
historical reminiscences of gutenberg have caused me to fall into reminiscences for i myself am something of an antiquity all things change in the procession of the years and it may be that i am among strangers it may be that the printer of today is not the printer of thirty-five years ago i was no stranger to him i knew him well i built his fire for him in the cold winter mornings i brought his water from the village pump i swept out his office i picked up his type from under his stand and if he was there to see i put the good type in his case and the broken ones among the hell matter and if he wasn't there to see i dumped it all with the pie on the imposing stone for that was the furtive fashion of the cub and i was a cub i wetted down the paper saturdays i turned sundays for this was a country weekly i rolled i washed the rollers i washed the forms i folded the papers i carried them around at dawn thursday mornings the carrier was then an object of interest to all the dogs in town if i had saved up all the bites i ever received i could keep m pasteur busy for a year i enveloped the papers that were for the mail we had a hundred town subscribers and three hundred and fifty country ones the town subscribers paid in groceries and the country ones in cabbage and cordwood when they paid at all which was merely sometimes and then we always stated the fact in the paper and gave them a puff and if we forgot it they stopped the paper every man on the town list helped edit the thing that is he gave orders as to how it was to be edited dictated its opinions marked out its course for it and every time the boss failed to connect he stopped his paper we were just infested with critics and we tried to satisfy them all over we had one subscriber who paid cash and he was more trouble to us than all the rest he bought us once a year body and soul for two dollars he used to modify our politics every which way and he made us change our religion four times in five years if we ever tried to reason with him he would threaten to stop his paper and of course that meant bankruptcy and destruction that man used to write articles a column and a half long leaded long primer and sign them junius or veritas or vox populi or some other high-sounding rot and then after it was set up he would come in and say that he had changed his mind which was a gilded figure of speech because he hadn't any and order it to be left out we couldn't stand such a waste as that we couldn't afford bogus in that office so we always took the leads out altered the signature credited the article to the rival paper in the next village and put it in well we did have one or two kinds of bogus whenever there was a barbecue or a circus or a baptizing we knocked off for half a day and then to make up for short matter we would turn over ads uh, turn over the whole page and duplicate it the other bogus was deep philosophical stuff which we judged nobody ever read so we kept a galley of it standing and kept on slapping the same old batches of it in every now and then till it got dangerous also in the early days of the telegraph we used to economize on the news we picked out the items that were pointless and barren of information and stood them on a galley and changed the dates and localities and used them over and over again till the public interest in them was worn to the bone we marked the ads but we seldom paid attention to the marks afterward so the life of a td and a tf ad was equally eternal 
i have seen a t d notice of a sheriff's sale still booming serenely along two years after the sale was over the sheriff dead and the whole circumstance become ancient history most of the yearly ads were patent medicine stereotypes and we used to fence with them life was easy with us if we pied a form we suspended till next week and we always suspended every now and then when the fishing was good and explained it by the illness of the editor a paltry excuse because that kind of a paper was just as well off with a sick editor as a well one and better off with a dead one than with either of them he was full of blessed egotism and placid self-importance but he didn't know as much as a three m quad he never said any type except in the rush of the last day and then he would smooch all the poetry and leave the rest to jeff for the solid takes he wrote with impressive flatulence and soaring confidence upon the vastest subjects but puffing alms gifts of wedding cake salty ice cream abnormal watermelons and sweet potatoes the size of your leg was his best hold he was always a poet a kind of poet of the carter's address breed and whenever his intellect separated and he read the result to the printers and asked for their opinion they were very frank and straightforward about it they generally scraped their rules on the boxes all the time he was reading and called it hogwash when he got through all this was thirty-five years ago when the man who could set seven hundred an hour could put on just as many airs as he wanted to and if these new york men who recently on a wager set two thousand an hour solid minion for four hours on a stretch had appeared in that office they would have been received as accomplishers of the supremely impossible and drenched with hospitable beer till the brewery was bankrupt i can see that printing office of prehistoric times yet with its horse bills on the walls its d boxes clogged with tallow because we always stood the candle in the k box nights its towel which was not considered soil until it could stand alone and other signs and symbols that marked the establishment of that kind in the mississippi valley and i can see also the tramping jour who flitted by in the summer and tarried a day with his wallet stuffed with one shirt and a hatful of handbills for if he couldn't get any type to set he would do a temperance lecture his way of life was simple his needs not complex all he wanted was plate and bed and money enough to get drunk on and he was satisfied but it may be as i have said that i am among strangers and sing the glories of a forgotten age to unfamiliar ears so i will make even and stop end of the compositor delivered at the tapathity dinner delmonico's new york january eighteenth eighteen eighty six read by john greenman this is the rejected version of the same speech by mark twain i began to set type when i was thirteen years old and have always had a right respect and reverence for that art there is not a material marvel of this marvelous age in which we live whose fatherhood cannot be traced distinctly back to a single point a single remote germ a single primal source the movable types of gutenberg and faust that invention of five hundred and thirty eight years ago was the second supreme event in the globe's creative history for by an unstrained metaphor one may say that on that day god said again let there be light and there was light from that faint and far source 
divergent threads of light stretched down through the centuries as from some star sun glowing out of dim solitudes of space to each and every precious and wonderful achievement of man's inventive genius which goes to make up today the sum of what we rightly call the most extraordinary age the world has ever seen each of these achievements is the result of the ray that came out from the star sun this age is the result of that fan of rays without that star sun this age had not been what changes have not these movable types witnessed and wrought in five hundred and thirty-eight years they have seen the implements of war so changed that an army corps of today, with its gatling guns and bombs and rifled cannon and other deadly things would hold a field against the combined armies of europe of gutenberg's time and a single ironclad of today sweep her fleets from the sea they have seen methods of travel so changed that a citizen today could give gutenberg a couple of years start and beat him around the world they have seen facility of speech so changed by the telephone that even a truth may travel farther in two minutes today than a lie could in a week in his day they have seen methods of written communication so changed that a new yorker may send a message to china now quicker than gutenberg could have carried it upstairs to his wife they have seen methods of printing so changed that a press of today will turn off a job in a year which a customer of gutenberg's would have had to wait nearly five centuries for and then get it perhaps when interest in that publication had pretty much died out and he would wish he hadn't ordered it they have seen the science of medicine and surgery so immeasurably changed that a doctor of today would save three patients in less time than it would take his doctor to kill three hundred they have seen industrial methods so amazingly accelerated by machinery that today a body of men would manufacture the stuffs and clothe and shoe a whole nation while a like body of gutenberg's contemporaries were doing the same for its capital city in a word those movable types in these five hundred and thirty-eight years have changed and marvelously accelerated and advanced and improved every art and every industry known to men they have utterly changed the face of art and industry in this whole world so that not one single thing is done today as men saw it done in the day of gutenberg and faust but no i am wrong there is one thing which they have not changed one thing which remains just what it was in the year thirteen forty eight unchanged unadvanced unimproved the movable type has taught the whole world something it has taught itself nothing isn't that a curious thing isn't it striking isn't it an actually stupefying thought the type-setting art is the one solitary art in the world which has stood stock still for five hundred years it is the art creative of arts yet it can create nothing for itself truly it is a sun it is the source and impulse of all intellectual life but it stands still imagine if you please the people of gutenberg's day suddenly snatched out of their graves and set down in new york without assent what a strange new world it would be to them what a strange and hopeless place for them poor fellows they would apply here they would apply there they would apply yonder 
but all to no use they could get no work they would find that the trades they learned five hundred years ago were worthless to them now so sweeping has been the change in methods within one week that entire host would be in the poorhouse with only one exception old gutenberg he would be subbing somewhere yes it is a most curious thing that which i have been talking about and the more one thinks it over the more strange and curious it seems i confess to you fellow craftsmen that i control one of the hundred and one devices and inventions for setting type by machinery but do not be uneasy i did not come here to advertise it i only came to disgorge some grave and thoughtful thoughts that is all and you have done me the grace to receive them in a less depreciative spirit than the foreman used to do in an office where i was a reporter twenty years ago when i brought in that sort of copy one of them used to say in printer's parlance here he comes with some more hell matter and the other said in a parlance of his own here he comes with some more hogwash printers are strangely frank in the matter of literary criticism end of the rejected version of the compositor read by john greenman this is section fifty of mark twain speaking this librivox recording is in the public domain remarks on copyright before the committee on patents united states senate washington d c january twenty eighth through twenty ninth eighteen eighty six read by john greenman january twenty eighth robert u johnson secretary of the authors copyright league called upon mark twain for a statement oh mr chairman they call upon me but it really seems to me that this matter has arrived at that point which i thought i foresaw yesterday when i said to these gentlemen you are bringing me to washington without previous instructions you have not educated me to my part and i shall not know how to play it i shall be apt when the time comes to play it after the simple honest fashion which was the method of my forefathers and it may damage this bill and that i do not want to do <clears throat> i seem to come here in the interest of the copyright league and the copyright league's interest as you have heard is centered upon the first bill mentioned here called the hawley bill and i do not wish to make any speech at all or any remarks lest i wander from the just path marked out for me by these gentlemen no doubt it is a just path but if i am here as a special pleader i am a special pleader with a weak spot in this cause and i will not commit myself or this committee further by any remarks if any gentleman desires to ask me questions then i do not care whom i commit i shall come as near telling the truth as the moment's inspiration shall enable me the chairman asked mark twain for his opinions on international copyright regardless of the league i comprehend your position and you will comprehend mine also i am in the position of one who would violate a hospitality rather if i should speak my mind i did speak my mind yesterday to the most intelligent member of this committee of the league besides myself and it fired him it grieved him 
and i almost promised that i would not divulge what my right feeling was but i did not promise that i would not take the contrary course january twenty ninth george walton green secretary of the executive committee of the publishers copyright league said now i am going to ask mr clemens to reconsider his decision if he made a decision and to speak right out like a little man well then i consider mr chairman and gentlemen of the committee that absolves me from all obligation to be dishonest or furtive or clandestine or whatsoever term you may choose to apply to the attitude i have held here before rather an attitude of silence in order that i should not commit or in any way jeopard the interests of this bill which the secretary has spoken of the hawley bill as i have understood them in the railway train or as well as i could understand them and you yourselves have seen that there is some difficulty in that they have still been clear upon one point and that is that they would take a stand upon the hawley bill in its simplicity and remain there i disagreed with them yesterday because i had come to exactly the conclusion that general hawley placed before you a little while ago that whether it is feasible whether it is possible to pass the hawley bill in its rigid simplicity or not is not to my mind the whole question at all i do consider that those persons who are called pirates and for whom general hawley has said a kind word which seemed to me entirely proper were made pirates by the collusion of the united states government which made them pirates and thieves i do not wish to cast any reflection upon the members of this committee because you gentlemen were not here at the time that was done you probably would never have done it but congress if anybody is to blame for their action it is not dishonesty they have that right and they have been working under that right a long time publishing what is called pirated books they have invested their money in that way and they did it in the confidence that they would be supported and no injustice done them i am afraid that the hawley bill in its original form pure and simple would work a great injustice to men who have vested rights in that direction and therefore the thing i wanted to say and which i did not like to say before occupying the position which i supposed i did was that i should like to see the printing clause in that bill i should like to see a copyright bill passed here which shall do no harm to anybody concerned in this matter and a great many more people are concerned in it than merely the authors in fact i suppose if the truth is confessed the authors are rather less concerned pecuniarily in any copyright measure than many other people publishers printers binders and so on the authors have one part in the matter but theirs is the larger part now i have said just what i wanted to say and it is not necessary for me to say anything more i simply consider that there are other rights involved aside from those of the author and they are vested rights too and nobody has a moral right to disturb that relation and so as i say i echo what general hawley said i cannot see any objection to the insertion of a clause which shall require that the books of a foreign author when copyrighted here 
shall be printed on this soil if there is anything further which the committee desires me to speak upon i shall be glad to have it indicated the chairman inquired about the status of an american author in england he gets just as perfect a copyright as it is possible for a government to give no english author is stronger in his copyright than an american author who has copyrighted his book there therefore the american author is in the position to say to london publishers you must pay my price or i simply will not publish then he does not have to publish if he does not get his price he need not publish his book his copyright is good and strong for forty-two years and it is quite easy to get there is no difficulty about that george william curtis asked about the copyright process i have been through so many processes that i hardly know how to explain it but the matter has always been simple with regard to england whatever complication there has been has occurred with canada you merely have to go and remain on british soil under the british flag while your book is publishing in england the chairman asked about foreign profits i can speak in my own case and i believe in one other i have for years received a larger royalty in england than i was receiving in america i do not mean a proportional profit but i mean a larger specific royalty in england than here a similar result would not be shown in the half yearly statement of account for the reason that the books here are published at a high price and there there is only one high priced edition and that is limited so that no matter how large the sale might be it is a sale of cheap books and the result is correspondingly small but i usually expect to receive one-third as much money from england as i receive in the united states on a book i expect the royalties to result in that way that however does not apply to any other european country the results from those countries are exceedingly small i might also mention that in the case of general grant's book the royalty paid in england on that book is the largest that ever was paid on a book in any country in any age of the world and that the royalties paid in germany and france are exceedingly large and of course the german and french copyrights on that book result through conventions with england end of remarks on copyright read by john greenman this is section fifty one of mark twain speaking this librivox recording is in the public domain yankee smith of camelot military service institution governor's island new york november eleventh eighteen eighty six in which mark twain reads from a connecticut yankee a book which he was working on at the time read by john greenman i am a yankee of the yankees a practical man nearly barren of sentiment or poetry in other words my father was a blacksmith my uncle was a horse doctor and i was both then i went over to the great arms factory and learned my real trade learned to make everything guns revolvers cannon boilers engines electric machines anything in short that anybody wanted anywhere in the world i became head boss and had a thousand men under me well a man like that is full of fight that goes without saying with a thousand rough men under one 
one has plenty of that sort of amusement well at last i met my match i got my dose it was during a misunderstanding conducted with iron crowbars with a fellow we used to call hercules he laid me out with a crusher alongside the head that made everything crack and seemed to make every joint of my skull lap over on its neighbor and then the world went out in darkness and i felt nothing more knew nothing more for a while and when i came to again i was standing under an oak tree and the factory was gone standing under an oak tree on the grass with a beautiful broad country a landscape spread out before me all to myself no not quite not entirely to myself there was a fellow on a horse looking down at me a fellow fresh out of a picture book he was in old-time armor from his head to his heel he had a helmet on like a cheese box with slits on it and he carried a shield and a sword and a prodigious spear and his horse had armor on too and gorgeous silken trappings red and green that hung around him like a bedgown to the ground and this apparition said to me fair sir will you joust said i will i which will you joust will you break a lance for land or lady said i what are you giving me you go along back to your circus or i'll report you now what does this fellow do but fall back a couple of hundred yards and then come tilting at me as hard as he could drive his cheese box down close and his long spear pointed straight at me i saw he meant business so i was up the tree when he arrived well he allowed i was his property the captive of his spear well there was argument on his side and the bulk of the advantage so i judged it best to humor him and we fixed up an agreement i was to go along with him and he wasn't to hurt me so i came down and we started away i walking by the side of his horse and we marched comfortably along through glades and over brooks that i could not remember to have seen before it puzzled me ever so much and yet we didn't come to any circus or any sign of a circus so i gave up the idea of a circus and concluded he was from an asylum but we never came to an asylum so i was up a stump as you may say when they reach the castle the yankee tries to get information from a man he encounters now my friend if i could see the head keeper just a minute only just a minute he said prithee do not let me let you what do not hinder me if the word please thee better and he was an undercook and had no time to talk though he would like to another time for it would just comfort his very liver to know where i got my clothes the yankee also meets a young page who casually announces that he was born in the year five thirteen it made the cold chills creep over me i stopped and said a little faintly now uh, maybe i didn't hear you just right would you say that again and say it slow what year did you say it was five thirteen and according to your notions according to your lights and superstitions what year is it now why he said the year five twenty eight the nineteenth of june well i felt a mournful sinking of the heart and muttered i shall never see my friends again never see my friends any more they won't be born for as much as a thousand years excerpts i made up my mind to two things if it was still the nineteenth century and i was among lunatics and couldn't get away i would boss that asylum or know the reason why and if on the other hand it was really the sixth century all right i didn't want any better thing i'd boss the whole country inside of three months 
for I judged I'd have the start on the best educated man in the kingdom by one thousand three hundred years. But I'm not a man to waste time, so I said to the boy, Clarence, if your name should happen to be Clarence, what's the name of that duck, that uh, galoot who brought me here? There didn't seem to be brains enough in the entire nursery to bait a fish-hook, but you didn't mind that after a little while, for you saw that brains were not needed in a society like that, and would have marred its symmetry and spoiled it. Well, of all the damned contracts, this is boss. I offered to sublet it to Sir Lancelot to let him have it at ninety days, with no margin. But no! He had got a better thing. He was going for a menagerie of one-eyed giants and a college of princesses. End of Yankee Smith of Camelot Read by John Greenman This is section 52 of Mark Twain Speaking. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Dinner Speech Stationer's Board of Trade Dinner, Hotel Brunswick, New York, February 10, 1887. Read by John Greenman. Gentlemen, I find this an evening of surprises. I came here through an understanding with the chairman that I having reformed, was not to break over pledges made and drift into an after-dinner speech unless I saw immoralities or crimes being committed, and, lo, I have waited in constant expectation that something would be said or done that would compel me to speak. But concerning what has been said and done here— I am bound to say that, thus far, they have been mere uh, misdemeanors. I have been introduced to you as an example of the author and the publisher. I am one of the latest publishers, and I am one of the oldest authors, and certainly one of the best. When I came here, I expected to remain in some humble capacity outside of the door, and never dreamt of being made conspicuous by taking a seat high up among the distinguished guests. But then I am used to being made conspicuous. As I say, I have found nothing really to attack. I expected Mr. Beeman to commit himself. Lawyers are always committing themselves. But Mr. Beeman was— was well, the fact is his speech can actually be complimented as to his attacking ben that is to say ben franklin an old dead man that can be explained franklin was sober because he lived in philadelphia why philadelphia is a sober city today what must it have been in franklin's time why it is as good as Sunday to be in Philadelphia now. Franklin was frugal, and as he says himself, with becoming modesty, he had no vices, because, although he little suspected it, he made a vice of frugality. Mr. Beeman wishes that, at the last, he may be shoved into a barrel of Madeira. But if he had lived here instead of in Philadelphia, he would have wanted to get the barrel of Madeira into him. I am here in the character of author and publisher, but I think I will let that rest. Oh, I can tell you a great deal about publishing, but I don't think I will. I am rather too fresh yet, and I am at the honest stage now, but after a while, when I graduate and grow rich, I will tell you all about it. Education is so common that an education is within the grasp of everyone, and if he does not want to pay for it, why, here is the state ready to pay for it for him. 
but sometimes i want to inquire what an education is i remember myself and all of you old fellows probably remember the same of yourselves that when i went to school i was told that an adjective is an adverb and it must be governed by the third person singular and all that sort of thing and when i got out of school i straightway forgot all about it in my combined character of publisher and author i receive a great many manuscripts from people who say they want a candid opinion whether that is good literature or not that is all a lie what they want is a compliment but as to this matter of education the first thing that strikes you is how much teaching has really been done and how much is worthless cramming you have all seen a little book called english as she is spoke now in my capacity of publisher i recently received a manuscript from a teacher which embodied a number of answers given by her pupils to questions propounded these answers show that the children had nothing but the sound to go by the sense was perfectly empty here are some of their answers to words they were asked to define auriferous pertaining to an orifice ammonia the food of the gods equestrian one who asks questions parasite a kind of umbrella ipecac a man who likes a good dinner and here is the definition of an ancient word honored by a great party republican a sinner mentioned in the bible and here is an innocent deliverance of a zoological kind there are a good many donkeys in the theological gardens here also is a definition which really isn't very bad in its way demagogue a vessel containing beer and other liquids here too is a sample of a boy's composition on girls which i must say i rather like girls are very stuck up and dignified in their manner and behavior they think more of dress than anything and like to play with dolls and rags they cry if they see a cow in a far distance and are afraid of guns they stay at home all the time and go to church every sunday they are always sick they are always funny and making fun of boys hands and they say how dirty they can't play marbles i pity them poor things they make fun of boys and then turn round and love them i don't believe they ever killed a cat or anything they look out every night and say oh at the moon lovely there is one thing i have not told and that is they always now their lessons better'n boys End of Dinner Speech Read by John Greenman This is Section 53 of Mark Twain Speaking. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. An Author's Soldiering 22nd Reunion Banquet, Union Veterans Association of Maryland, Hotel Rennert, Baltimore, April 8, 1887 read by john greenman you union veterans of maryland have prepared your feast and offered to me a rebel veteran of missouri the wound healing bread and salt of a gracious hospitality do you realize all the vast significance of the situation do you sense the whole magnitude of this conjunction and perceive with what 
opulence of blessing for this nation it is freighted what is it we are doing reflect upon this stage tonight we play the closing scene of the mightiest drama of modern times and ring down for good and all the curtain raised at sumter six and twenty years ago the two grand divisions of the nation which we name in general terms the north and the south have shaken hands long ago and given and taken the kiss of peace was anything lacking to make the reconciliation perfect the fusion of feeling complete yes the great border states attached to those grand divisions but belonging to neither of them and independent of both were silent had made no forgiving sign to each other across the chasm left by the convulsion of war <coughs> and the world grieved that this was so but tonight the union veteran of maryland clasps hands with the rebel veteran of missouri and the gap is closed in this supreme moment the imperfect welding of the broken union is perfected at last and from this hour the seam of the joining shall no more be visible the long tragedy is ended ring down the curtain when your secretary invited me to this reunion of the union veterans of maryland he requested me to come prepared to clear up a matter which he said had long been a subject of dispute and bad blood in war circles in this country to wit the true dimensions of my military services in the civil war and the effect which they had upon the general result i recognize the importance of this thing to history and i have come prepared here are the details i was in the civil war two weeks in that brief time i rose from private to second lieutenant the monumental feature of my campaign was the one battle which my command fought it was in the summer of sixty one if i do say it it was the bloodiest battle ever fought in human history there is nothing approaching it for destruction of human life in the field if you take in consideration the forces engaged and the proportion of death to survival and yet you do not even know the name of that battle neither do i it had a name uh, but i have forgotten it it is no use to keep private information which you can't show off now look at the way history does it takes the battle of boonville fought nearby about the date of our slaughter and shouts its teeth loose over it and yet never even mentions ours doesn't even call it an affair doesn't call it anything at all never even heard of it whereas what are the facts why these in the battle of boonville there were two thousand men engaged on the union side and about as many on the other supposed to be the casualties all told were two men killed and not all of these were killed outright but only half of them for the other man died in hospital next day i know that because his great-uncle was second cousin to my grandfather who spoke three languages and was perfectly honorable and upright though he had warts all over him and used to uh, but never mind about that the facts are just as i say 
and I can prove it. Two men killed in that battle of Boonville, and that's the whole result. All the others got away, on both sides. Now then, in our battle there were just fifteen men engaged on our side, all brigadier generals but me, and I was a second lieutenant. On the other side there was one man. He was a stranger. We killed him. It was night, and we thought he was an army of observation. He looked like an army of observation. In fact, he looked bigger than an army of observation would in the daytime, and some of us believed he was trying to surround us, and some thought he was going to try to turn our position, and so we shot him. Poor fellow, he probably wasn't an army of observation after all, but that wasn't our fault. As I say, he had all the look of it in that dim light. It was a sorrowful circumstance but he took the chances of war, and he drew the wrong card. He overestimated his fighting strength, and he suffered the likely result. But he fell as the brave should fall, with his face to the foe and feet to the field. So we buried him with the honors of war, and took his things. So began and ended the only battle in the history of the world where the opposing force was utterly exterminated, swept from the face of the earth to the last man. And yet you don't know the name of that battle. You don't even know the name of that man. Now then, for the argument. Suppose I had continued in the war, and gone on as I began, and exterminated the opposing force every time, every two weeks, where would your war have been? Why, you see yourself, the conflict would have been too one-sided. There was but one honorable course for me to pursue, and I pursued it. I withdrew to private life, and gave the Union cause a chance. There now, you have the whole thing in a nutshell. It was not my presence in the Civil War that determined that tremendous contest. It was my retirement from it that brought the crash. It left the Confederate side too weak. And yet when I stop and think, I cannot regret my course. No, when I look abroad over this happy land, with its wounds healed and its enmities forgotten, this reunited sisterhood of majestic states, this freest of free commonwealths the sun in his course shines upon, this one sole country nameable in history or tradition, where a man is a man, and manhood the only royalty, this people ruled by the justest and wholesomest laws and government yet devised by the wisdom of men this mightiest of the civilized empires of the earth in numbers in prosperity in progress and in promise and reflect that there is no north no south any more but that as in the old time it is now and will remain forever in the hearts and speech of americans our land our country our giant empire and the flag floating in its firmament our flag i would not wish it otherwise no when i look about me and contemplate these sublime results i feel deep down in my heart that i acted for the best when i took my shoulder out from under the confederacy and let it come down End of An Author's Soldiering Read by John Greenman This is section 54 of Mark Twain Speaking. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Dinner Speech Ninth Annual Reunion Banquet 
Army and Navy Club of Connecticut, Central Hall, Hartford, April 27, 1887. Read by John Greenman. I will detain you with only just a few words, just a few thousand words, and then give place to a better man, if he has been created. Lately, a great and honored author, Matthew Arnold, has been finding fault with General Grant's English. Well, that would be fair enough, maybe, if the examples of imperfect English averaged more instances to the page in General Grant's book than they do in Mr. Arnold's criticism upon the book. But they don't. It would be fair enough, maybe, if such instances were commoner in General Grant's book than they are in the works of the average standard author. But they aren't. In truth, General Grant's derelictions in the manner of grammar and construction are not more frequent than are such derelictions in the works of a majority of the professional authors of our time, and of all previous times, authors as exclusively and painstakingly trained to the literary trade as was General Grant to the trade of war. This is not a random statement. It is a fact, and easily demonstrable. I have at home a book called Modern English Literature, Its Blemishes and Defects, by Henry H. Breen, F.S.A., a countryman of Mr. Arnold. In it I find examples of bad grammar and slovenly English from the pens of Sidney Smith, Sheridan, Hallam, Waitley, Carlyle, both Disraelis, Allison, Junius, Blair, Macaulay, Shakespeare, Milton, Gibbon, Southey, Bulwer, Cobbett, Dr. Samuel Johnson, Trench, Lamb, Landor, Smollett, Walpole, Walker, of uh, the Dictionary, uh, Christopher North, Kirk White, Mrs. Sigourney, Benjamin Franklin, Sir Walter Scott, and Mr. Lindley Murray, who made the grammar. In Mr. Arnold's paper on General Grant's book, we find a couple of grammatical crimes and more than several examples of very crude and slovenly English, enough of them to easily entitle him to a lofty place in that illustrious list of delinquents just named. The following passage, all by itself, ought to elect him. <clears throat> Meade suggested to Grant that he might wish to have immediately under him Sherman, who had been serving with Grant in the West. He begged him not to hesitate if he thought it for the good of the service. Grant assured him that he had no thought of moving him, and in his memoirs, after relating what had passed, he adds, etc., to read that passage a couple of times would make a man dizzy to read it four times would make him drunk general grant's grammar is as good as anybody's but if this were not so mr breen would brush that inconsequential fact aside and hunt his great book for higher game mr breen makes this discriminating remark to suppose that, because a man is a poet or a historian, he must be correct in his grammar, is to suppose that an architect must be a joiner, or a physician a compounder of medicines. Mr. Breen's point is well taken. If you should climb the mighty Matterhorn to look out over the kingdoms of the earth, it might be a pleasant incident to find strawberries up there. But, great Scott, you don't climb the Matterhorn for strawberries. I don't think Mr. Arnold was quite wise. 
for he well knew that that Briton or American was never yet born who could safely assault another man's English. He knew as well as he knows anything that the man never lived whose English was flawless. Can you believe that Mr. Arnold was immodest enough to imagine himself an exception to this cast-iron rule, the sole exception discoverable within the three or four centuries during which the English language proper has been in existence? No, Mr. Arnold did not imagine that. He merely forgot that, for a moment, he was moving into a glass house and he had hardly got fairly in before General Fry was shivering the pains over his head. People may hunt out what microscopic motes they please, but, after all, the fact remains, and cannot be dislodged, that General Grant's book is a great, and in its peculiar department, unique, an unapproachable literary masterpiece. In their line there is no higher literature than those modest, simple memoirs. Their style is at least flawless, and no man can improve upon it, and great books are weighed and measured by their style and matter, not by the trimmings and shadings of their grammar. There is that about the sun which makes us forget its spots, and when we think of General Grant, our pulses quicken and his grammar vanishes. We only remember that this is the simple soldier who, all untaught of the silken phrase-makers, linked words together with an art surpassing the art of the schools, and put into them a something which will still bring to American ears, as long as America shall last, the roll of his vanished drums, and the tread of the marching hosts. What do we care for grammar when we think of the man that put together that thunderous phrase, unconditional and immediate surrender, and those others I propose to move immediately upon your works. I propose to fight it out on this line if it takes all summer. Mr. Arnold would doubtless claim that that last sentence is not strictly grammatical, and yet it did certainly wake up this nation as a hundred million tons of A number one fourth proof hard boiled hide bound grammar from another mouth couldn't have done. And finally we have that gentler phrase, that one which shows you another true side of the man, shows that in his soldier heart there was room for other than gory war mottoes, and in his tongue the gift to fitly phrase them. Let us have peace. End of dinner speech read by John Greenman.